One thing that I've been thinking about lately is how it is actually more dangerous to acknowledge and downplay than it is just to straight up deny whatever evil it is that you've done or whatever evil it is that a country has done. So for example, uh, Turkey denies the Armenian genocide. Turkey just straight up denies the Armenian genocide. Japan will acknowledge that it genocided its Asian neighbors, but it will also downplay the very atrocities that it committed in the Second World War. Uh, I would argue that it is actually more dangerous to acknowledge and downplay than it is to just straight up deny. When you straight up deny an evil that your country has committed, it pretty much just lets everyone know that you're evil. So everyone can just acknowledge, oh, you're evil. You just hardcore, black and white, emphatically deny the fact that your country has committed a genocide. So we just know that you're evil. And if anyone tries to argue otherwise, we can just point out the fact that you outright deny a genocide that your, com that your country committed. And that's that. That's it. You deny something that is just an obvious historical fact. Whereas if I bring up the fact that Japanese parliamentarians have denied Japanese atrocities, such as the rape of Nanking or the mass rape of Korean women during the Second World War, you will always have a bunch of weebs and a bunch of anime fanatics popping up saying, but Japan has acknowledged uh, Nanking. Japan has acknowledged its past atrocities. What are you talking about? Meanwhile, they're just leaving out the fact that for many years, Japanese parliamentarians have denied these very atrocities. So officially, you can find statements from the Japanese government acknowledging the atrocities that Japan committed during the Second World War. Uh, but at the same time, you can find a plethora of statements from Japanese politicians going all the way up to Shinzo Abe himself denying that these atrocities took place. So there is an acknowledgement, but at the same time, there is a downplaying of the crimes. And there's also denial of the crimes done by various politicians. I would argue that this is actually much more dangerous than just straight up denial, than just emphatic denial. The reason why I say this is because to acknowledge and downplay or to acknowledge and deny at the same time is much more deceptive. And the more deceptive something is, the more dangerous it is because it can easily spread to, to more people. It's much easier to spread that type of deception than it is to uh, convince people that straight up denying something is okay. So when Turkey emphatically denies the Armenian genocide, People, it's more difficult for people who love Turkey to come up and say, oh, well, Turkey's great. Well, they emphatically deny the Armenian genocide. Whereas when you bring up Japanese atrocities, all of the weebs come up and say, well, they've acknowledged it, so they're fine. Japanese nationalism isn't bad. <laughs> so it's actually much more da dangerous and much more deceptive. Uh, it is very, very effective and efficient subterfuge when you are acknowledging and downplaying. So it's like the Vatican. Uh, for many years, the Vatican denied and covered up the fact that its clergy members were raping children and molesting children and preying on young boys and sexually assaulting young boys. And the Vatican covered up, covered up this crime. And it spent years and decades covering it up. But now the Vatican will acknowledge that certain members of its clergy raped children and sexually assaulted young men, but it will also downplay it. So an example of this can be seen in someone like Trent Horn. Trent Horn will acknowledge that the Vatican uh, had covered things up, or he'll acknowledge that there were priests who were pedophiles, and there was a whole uh, uh, sex abuse scandal. But then he'll say things like, well, you know, 4% uh, of the priesthood could be pedophiles, but 4% uh, of the general population are, are pedophiles. So it actually just reflects the population. Uh, I've seen 
uh, that guy that's very popular, the Catholic uh, bishop who's very popular, Bishop Robert Barron. I think we should start calling him Ro start calling him Robert Barron. I think that name is more fitting. Uh, but I heard Bishop Robert Barron say say something to the likes of, "Well, uh, pedophiles only make four percent of the population, uh, uh, and and." and uh, for, uh, pe pedophiles in the priesthood only make up 4% of the Catholic priesthood. So therefore, it's just a reflection of the general population. And so he's acknowledging, you know, Robert Barron will acknowledge that there was a, a child sex abuse scandal, and it's still going on, I think. Uh, you know, there, there are priests who prey on young men, they prey on... on on boys, it still goes on. Robert Barron will acknowledge it, and he'll say, "Yeah, there was this abuse that took place, but you know, pedophiles in the priesthood only make up four percent of the priesthood, and 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 uh, there and, and there's only uh, there's only uh, you know the the in the general population, uh, pedophiles only make up four percent, so it's only a reflection." You know, the, the pedophile population in the priesthood is only a reflection of the general society. So he acknowledges it, but he downplays, right? He acknowledges it. He'll say, oh, yes, yes, there was this terrible sex abuse scandal in the Catholic Church, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, only 4% of the priests are, are pedophiles. And that actually reflects the general population. So he acknowledges it and he belittles, he downplays it. And that's very, very dangerous. Uh, because if the Vatican just straight up denied it, then people could say, oh, look, the Vatican is evil, right? It's very, very clear. But when the Vatican acknowledges it and, and its members, its acolytes acknowledge it, but they downplay it at the same time, then people can come out and say, well, they acknowledge it, so just get over it. You know, they acknowledge it, but they also downplay it when they say, well, it's just, uh, you know, the, 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 the pedophile population the pederast population is so small so it's not really that that big of a deal and then they'll always reference this thing called the john jay study there's this study that was done it's called the john jay study and the john jay study or however they call it uh, i think it's i think that's what it's called says that uh, only four percent of the catholic priesthood are pedophiles only right i think it's four per i think it's four percent too much uh, but the the same study that was financed by the Vatican also says that homosexuals in the priesthood uh, have a much higher number than in the general population. So there's actually a higher number of homosexuals in the priesthood than they are in the general population. There's more homosexuality in the Catholic priesthood than in the regular general population. And the same study that these people keep referencing says this, but they don't bring that up. They don't acknowledge that. They like to omit that part. So they acknowledge that there was abuse and the Vatican covered it up. They'll acknowledge that, but they'll downplay it at the same time by saying, well, it's only 4% of the priesthood, so who cares? And there's a lot of sophistry that goes on. There's a lot of sophistry that takes place. Uh, last night I was listening to a debate between... Trent Horn and Timothy Gordon, and they were arguing over the death penalty in the Catholic Church, and they were arguing over the fact that Pope Francis just uh, condemned the death penalty and stated that Catholics all around the world should be pushing for the universal abolition of the death penalty. So basically, Pope Francis and the Catholic Church uh, are now in the business of exactly what churches like the Episcopalian Church has been pushing for, uh, and that is the abolition of the death penalty. So the Roman Catholic Church is basically at the level of the Episcopalians and the Methodists. It's at the same tier of the Episcopalians and the Anglicans, uh, which is just a, a, an empty shell of a religious institution that is very much so atheistic in its way of thinking, but it masquerades itself under the veneer of religion. And during this debate between Timothy Horn, or Timothy Horn, between uh, Timothy Gordon and, um, and Trent Horn, uh, 
Uh, Timothy Gordon was arguing against the Vatican's move to condemn the death penalty, whereas Trent Horn uh, was arguing in favor for what Pope Francis did, of course, because he's just, he's an acolyte and a water carrier for the Vatican. And uh, Timothy Gordon was referencing past popes, referencing, for example, Pope Innocent III and also Pope Pius XII, referencing their statements in support of the death penalty. And Timothy Gordon pointed out that Pope Francis does not really reference uh, church tradition. And other than John Paul II, he doesn't reference past popes because past popes, with the exception of John Paul II, supported the death penalty. Past popes like Innocent III or uh, Pius XII supported the death penalty. I believe also Pi uh, Pope Pius V made a statement in support of the death penalty. So how can Pope Francis just come up and say, well, that's all done away with. We're done with the death penalty. We abolish the death penalty. We condemn the death penalty. And let's all push for the universal prohibition of the death penalty as Catholics. And he exhorts Catholics to become anti-death penalty activists. Well, how can Pope Francis just change the catechism when for centuries the Catholic Church as an institution have supported the death penalty? It's very arbitrary. And Trent Horn said, well, Pope Francis can do that because he is the authority. And Timothy Gordon pointed out before that that when Pope Francis was making his statement against the death penalty, he quoted himself. So how can he quote himself? He doesn't quote Innocent III. He doesn't quote uh, Pius XII. He quotes himself. And Horn said, well, he can because he is the authority. So Pope Francis is the authority. He's the big dictator who can just arbitrarily change what has been stated in not just in tradition, but also in the Bible. And, and Timothy Gordon quoted uh, Genesis 9 where God tells Noah, Whoever sheds man's blood by man's hands shall his blood be shed. And that was not a commandment that was just made to Moses. That was a commandment that was made to Noah and thereby to all the sons of Noah and thereby to all the children of Noah and thereby it is a universal law. You can't just say, well, that's Mosaic law. It doesn't apply to us. This is a law that was stated by God. No, no, I love how people sit sit there. Well, Aquinas says this, and uh, Aristotle says that, and Socrates says that. Like we're all going to start quoting, I don't know, Greek pedophiles to uh, to 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 justify our morality. Um, God, <laughs> God says this to Noah. God says, uh, institute the death penalty. He says this to Noah, and and Timothy Gordon was making all these arguments, and and he said. You know, how can Francis quote himself and make this arbitrary decision to condemn the death penalty and just ignore what the Bible says and ignore what tradition says? And Trent Horn said, well, he can because he is the authority. He can quote himself because he is the authority. So the, the Vatican becomes, becomes this dictatorial religion where the Pope is a dictator and he can just make arbitrary decisions and change the catechism because he doesn't like whatever it says in the catechism. And it reminds me of what I read today. I'm, I've been reading this book uh, by Michael Burleigh. It's called The Third Reich. And it, it has been a very educational read on the rise of the Third Reich and how it came up and all that. And he talks about how they were Catholics who, who followed Hitler and they loved Nazism. Now, to be fair, uh, and, and Burleigh acknowledges this in his history, um, the great majority of Catholics in Germany were against Nazism. The great majority of Catholics in Poland, and, Ca and Poland is a Catholic country, the great majority of Catholics in Poland hated fascism and they hated Nazism. And uh, the majority of the non-Jews who saved Jews during the Holocaust, who went out of their way to actually save Jews from the Nazi reign of terror, were Polish people. So we have to be fair when we talk about um, Catholic Nazis. I don't want to go on a whole tangent about how, oh yeah, there were all these Catholic Nazis as if as if they were the majority. They weren't. The majority of Catholics were against Nazism. In fact, the Pope saved hundreds of thousands of Jews from the Nazi death camps. But when you look at countries like Croatia or Ukraine, you had a huge chunk of the Catholic populations of these countries supporting the Nazis, and a lot of them joined the SS. Especially when you look at a country like Croatia, where you had the Ustasha, 
which worked with the Nazis in their slaughter of hundreds of thousands of Serbs and also a lot of Jewish people to the point where they killed in total about a million people. And I've always wondered why there were Catholics who supported Hitler. What is it about what was it about their theology or their way of thinking that led them to make that decision to join the Nazis and to sympathize with with Adolf Hitler? And in this book that I've been reading by Michael Berlay on the rise of the Third Reich, he talks about this a little bit, uh, at least in the in the part of the book that I've that I've read so far. And he acknowledges that the majority of Catholics were against the Nazis, but he acknowledges also that there was a minority of German Catholics who who loved Hitler and who supported it. And he explains why, and he says that the the dictatorial and authoritarian nature of Catholicism was very appealing to a lot of trad Catholics, and that translated into their admiration for the authoritarian ideology of Nazism. So because you had these trad Catholics who loved the authoritarian nature of Catholicism, that led to them loving the authoritarian nature of of Nazism. And when you look at Leninist communism, you see that 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 original form of communism, we're not talking about Stalinism, which borrowed uh, from the traditional uh, Christian values. When you look at Lenin, Leninist communism, you see that there was a lot of breaking of tradition. There was a lot of transgression against tradition. Uh, the, for example, uh, a lot of communists wanted the they wanted to enact um, uh, women's suffrage. I believe it was Soviet Russia that was the first country to allow women to vote before the United States even. Uh, Soviet Russia, communist Russia, allowed for women to vote. Why? Because they were breaking a traditional norm. Uh, the nuclear family, uh, the early communists, the Leninist communists were against this idea of the nuclear family. They saw it as a form of, I believe, bourgeoisie tyranny, uh, things like abortion the the communists supported that's why there was always a very there, for a long time there was a very high number of abortions um, in Russia in, in communist Russia now Stalin came in and he sort of borrowed from tradition and he wanted to use tradition and he didn't like a lot of the the libertine ways of thinking that the Trotskyites or the Leninists had but nonetheless before Stalin there was a lot of animosity against tradition by the communists Whereas with Nazism, you had this respect for the family. I mean, this was on the surface. There was a lot of degeneracy amongst the Nazis, especially amongst the earliest Nazi followers of Hitler. Uh, but in Nazism, on, at the surface level, there was this admiration for the family. There was this, um, there was this um, insistence on keeping the, the traditional nuclear family. There was a push for women to have more children. There was this conservative emphasis on tradition and a lot this appealed to a lot of people in Germany a lot of conservatives really really loved this they that's that's one of the things that they loved about the Nazis and so you can look at Nazism and how it won the hearts of a lot of religious people and you can see how that happened and there are a lot of people today uh, who would look at that and actually agree with a lot of the things that the Nazis say. In fact, the Nazis said things that most of us would agree with as far as tradition goes, but they tainted tradition with racism and with eugenics and social Darwinism. They took something that was good and they corrupted it. And it reminds me of what Jesus uh, says in, in the New Testament. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The Pharisees, for the most part, were preaching truth but they corrupted the truth with a little bit of their leaven. And uh, Josephus actually tells us that the Pharisees taught orthodoxy, but Josephus also tells us that they taught reincarnation. Josephus also tells us that the Pharisees actually rejected the idea of absolute truth, and they believed that truth could be something that is relative. And I believe that when Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, he had to have been referring to this because reincarnation is not in the Bible and uh, the idea of relativism is definitely not in the Bible, but the Pharisees had this. And I, and I think this is the reason why uh, the Pharisees didn't mind allying with people that, that they were against. Uh, the Pharisees were not with the Samaritans. They 
agreed tre- they agreed uh, tremendously with the with with the um, with the Sadducees. Um, uh, for example, uh, the Sadducees only believe they believed that the only legitimate books were the first five books of Moses. They rejected the other books. The Sadducees also. Uh, rejected the existence of angels. They believed that angels didn't exist. I believe they also rejected the idea of an afterlife. The Sadducees were the closest thing to atheism within Jewish culture that you can find in antiquity. And the Pharisees obviously were in were in huge disagreements theologically with the Sadducees. Uh, and the Pharisees also were more moderate when it came to political violence. The Pharisees were, for the most part, not in favor for uh, Jewish revolution against the Roman government. That was something that the Zealots were more in favor of than the Pharisees were. But nonetheless, when it came to killing Jesus, uh, when Pontius Pilate said, which do you want me to free, Jesus Christ or, or uh, Barabbas, the Pharisees were in agreement with the mob that Barabbas should be released, even though Barabbas was a terrorist who murdered Roman soldiers, or at least one Roman soldier. And this was something that the Pharisees otherwise would not have supported. But when it came to the killing of Jesus, they supported it. So to them, I, I, truth and morality was situational. They could they could change how they conducted things. They could change how they saw things depending on what was to their advantage. And at that moment, what was to their advantage was killing Jesus. And so the truth really didn't mean anything at that point. They didn't mind making compromises or making agreements with the, with the Sadducees or the fanatics because they had an end goal. And the end goal wasn't based on orthodoxy or truth. It was based on their bad faith uh, objectives. So sophistry is everywhere and sophistry and the denying of truth and also just the denial of the obvious but the denial of the obvious in very deceptive ways is so destructive and it's so so dangerous Um, and so this is why i say it is more dangerous to acknowledge but downplay than it is just to straight up deny things and it reminds me of the rise of the Nazis and the rise of future Nazis. So when you look at the Nazis of today, when you look at how they're working, they're pointing to facts to justify their existence. They're pointing to facts to justify their own evil ideologies. Genocide is always justified by facts. Now, of course, they mix truth with lies, this is how deception works, and everyone knows that the best liars are the ones who can give you mainly truth and mix it with lies. Those are the most effective liars. The worst liars are the ones who just deny the obvious. This is why I say it's more dangerous when, it's more dangerous when truth is acknowledged but downplayed than when truth is just denied. If someone comes to you and says that the sky is green, you don't really care about what that person has to say because he's just emphatically denying something that is just outright obvious. But when someone comes up to you and says, actually, these Nazis are the good guys, and let me tell you why, and they're listing out facts that you can't deny, that's much more dangerous, much more uh, destructive, and it's much more effective when it comes to spreading their ideology. Um, this is why uh, it's this, this is why it, the devil mixes truth with lies. <laughs> this is why the devil will quote scripture. He takes scripture, he quotes it, references it, but misconstrues it for his own evil ideology. Uh, truth is power. Knowledge is power. Facts are extremely dangerous things. They are very dangerous things. And when you have the facts, you have when you have the facts and you're talking to people who don't have the facts, you are in a serious advantage over them. And you have the responsibility just to give them the facts without your own misconstrued agenda. But when you have the facts and you're talking to people who don't have the facts and you tell them the facts mixed with your own agenda, that is extremely dangerous and very destructive. Uh, and what, what, what 
racist and Nazis today do is they will say, okay, we don't like these people and here is why. And they list a bunch of facts. It's like, I've noticed that there's a lot of hatred against black people on Twitter, a tremendous amount of it. And they will always reference the high crime rate. They'll say, well, here is the high crime rate amongst blacks. Here is the fact that they make up uh, what is it, 13% of the population, but they but they do 50% of the murders in the United States. And it's like, well, you know, it's you can't really argue against that fact because it's true. But what they do is they present that fact and then they slip in their agenda. They slide in their agenda, which is eugenic social Darwinism and really the evil of just attributing to an entire population the evil actions of what a few members of that population have done. And it's just to get you to support the ideology of eugenic policy, eugenist policy. So they will reference facts to justify evil. And evil is always justified with facts. Now, it's misconstrued, but nonetheless, they, they will use facts. Same thing goes with any genocidal ideology. Um, and what Nazis today do is they will point to the facts and they will acknowledge the facts, but they misconstrue it. The reason why this is so dangerous is because, well, obviously it's a very effective means to convince people. Now, when you look at the rise of Nazism, which I've been studying uh, lately, you will also see that the Nazis referenced facts. For example, they were, in fact, communist terrorists who were Jewish who committed horrendous acts of violence. They were communist Jews who tried to do revolutions, who did attempted revolutions, who were agents of Lenin, who were agents of the Soviet Union, and they were working to get Germany to become subject to the Soviet Union. They were actually working to get Germany to become a territory of the Soviet Union. The Nazis referenced all these facts to get people to hate Jews and to support genocide and to support eugenics, eugenic policies. This is not really discussed. The fact that Nazis used uh, the the realities of left-wing terrorism done by a number of Jewish people, this is not really discussed. And it's a huge, not only is it dangerous not to discuss this, but it's a huge injustice and disservice to the study on the Holocaust. Because when Nazis today reference facts and you say, well, wait a second, your ideology parallels with Nazism, their acolytes come along and say, no, 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 the Nazis were just a bunch of lunatic thugs who killed people out of nowhere, and they made up a bunch of lies, and 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 they, they just pulled things from nowhere. They pulled their, their ideas out of nowhere, and they were able to uh, manipulate the, the masses because so many German people were dirt poor because of the war, and Hitler was a very uh, was a very charismatic speaker, and people loved him, and he gave them hope, and so they followed him, et cetera, et cetera. That that narrative does a huge disservice to the study on the Holocaust. The reason why we study the Holocaust is to prevent another Holocaust. That's it. That is the reason why we study the Holocaust. There is no other reason. That should be the only reason why we study the Holocaust. We shouldn't be studying the Holocaust because, oh, we watched Schindler's List and we want to get more facts so we can understand the film better. Uh, we shouldn't study the Holocaust because it makes for very, very grim material for a Hollywood production. We should be studying the Holocaust to prevent another Holocaust. And the way we do that is by studying not only how the Nazis rose, but why people were following the Nazis. The reason why a lot of people were following the Nazis was because they were communist terrorists who were Jewish people who did acts of violence and acts of terror in Germany, and they were working to get Germany to become a Soviet, uh, a Soviet territory. And so Hitler came along and said, I'm going to save you from these people. And they followed him. He referenced facts. The Nazis referenced facts. They used facts to justify their own existence, to justify their ideology. And the reason why it's so dangerous that we don't acknowledge this is because when Nazis pop up in the future and they start referencing facts, and someone comes along and says, well, the ideology of these present-day Nazis is similar to the Nazis of the past— people will come along and say, no, 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 the Nazis of the past just pulled things out of nowhere and were just roughneck thugs and lunatics who just killed people because they were lunatics. These Nazis are actually different because they're actually using, they're, they're actually pointing to facts and no one else is pointing to. And there, thereby, the present-day Nazis 
are can effectively uh, spread their poison and people will think that they're great because they're spreading facts. When you tell them, no, 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 they're like the Nazis of the past, people will say, no, 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 the Nazis were just lunatics who just pulled things out of nowhere and their whole... Uh, their whole ideology was just pulled out of nowhere, and they they were able to deceive people, but they weren't. But but they weren't referencing facts like these people. So by understanding the strategy of using facts, and and misconstruing them, and using facts to justify evil, we can actually anticipate the strategy. We can understand what they're doing. We can recognize that their strategy of misconstruing facts was used by the Nazis, and we can thereby recognize and discern what it is that they're doing. And we can we can educate people on this and get people to see and to get people to get people's brains to click and understand that that's how genocidal ideologues work. But when you actually watch documentaries on the rise of the Third Reich, what is it that you always hear? You always just hear, oh, well, people in Germany were dirt poor, they were in poverty, and they followed Hitler because he was just a charismatic speaker. That's not the only reason why people were following Hitler. They, they were following Hitler because they believed that he was going to save them from the evil left-wing communist. That's why a lot of people uh, loved Hitler and they followed him. In fact, uh, you know, 10 plus years before the rise of the Nazis, there was a Jewish foreign minister by the name of Walter Rathenau who was assassinated by a right-wing terrorist. After he was assassinated, literally millions of Germans demonstrated in the streets asking for the government to do something about right-wing terrorism. And they gathered in the streets expressing their love for Walter Rathenau. And if you were, to, if someone were to tell you in 1922, that's when these demonstrations, that's when these demonstrations happened. If someone were to tell you in 1922 that the third, that the Third Reich was going to rise up and that Germany was going to become an anti-Jewish, uh, uh, tyrannical country, you wouldn't believe me because you would be saying, "Well, how could you say that when millions of Germans are loving this Jewish man who was assassinated?" And that's why so many people, be, years before Hitler took power, could not believe that the Nazis, that the Nazis were going to take power in Germany. So many people just couldn't fathom the idea of Germany being a Nazi country. So people back in those days could not fathom that something like Nazism could take over Germany. And people today cannot fathom that Nazism could ever rise up again. People just, most people can't fathom this. Most people wouldn't agree with you. Because they don't understand history. They think that at that time, it was so easy for people like the Nazis to take over. But when you look at the fact that millions of Germans loved Walter Rathenau, a Jewish industrialist, you could, it's, it's, actually, it's actually very easy at that point to make parallels between our time and the time before the Nazis took over. And when people... Were warning when you had people like Pierre Van Passen who was warning people that the Nazis were going to take over. Most people didn't believe him. Because people in those days couldn't fathom that a tyrannical ideology like the Nazis could take over, just like people today can't fathom it. And people today cannot understand or they don't understand and they can't really fathom how something like Nazism can rise. But then they'll go on and they'll they will fall for right wing ideology. And when you say, well, this is like Nazism, they'll say, no, 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 it's not like Nazism. It's, that was different. That was different. That was different. And what you learn from history is that the German people weren't always Nazis. The German people for a very long time actually weren't even thinking about hating Jews, but it happened. The German society shifted to Nazism. How did that happen? It happened because they were actually real events that angered the German people and that terrified the German people. And the Nazis took that to get people to follow them. And the same exact thing eventually is going to happen in the future. Nazism is going to come back. Nazism is going to be revived. And how is that going to happen? The same way it happened in the, in the past. But no one's going to see it coming. Most people aren't going to see it coming because they think that the Nazis just popped up out of nowhere and they pulled things out of nowhere and they, their ideas came out of nowhere and people just decided to follow them. And they're going to think that the Nazis of the future are different because those Nazis are actually stating the truth. 
and the, and the Nazis of the past didn't. But by understanding that the Nazis of the past did say true things, then you can anticipate the strategy. You can anticipate it and you can recognize it. And you can help people understand how deception works and you can help people actually recognize it for themselves. So the devil will always mix truth with lies and it is more dangerous to acknowledge and downplay than it is just to straight up deny things. Anyway, you guys just heard some Theo Logi. God bless.